Hello AP Statistics students. This is Mr. Liao coming to you live from my home office and I am going to go over 5.3 simulating experiments. I do not anticipate this being a long lesson. In fact, I took out one example I used last year because it's probably too much work and especially with me not around, it's not really worth your time doing right now and it involves a concept you haven't learned yet. So. I would encourage you to have a table of random numbers with you, have a calculator because you're going to need it to do the simulations, and then you'll be ready to do it in class on Friday or on Thursday. There's no class on Friday. All right? So hopefully everyone had a chance to do the age discrimination activity because I'm going to reference it during these notes. So two goals today. Define and list the five steps in a simulation, and then you are going to conduct a simulation or two both by using a table of random digits, or the numbers I give you, and a calculator. So here we go. Yesterday what we did in class, or today depending on when you're listening to this, was an age discrimination simulation. We wanted to know, based strictly on chance and giving some, given some assumptions, what were the chances, what was the likelihood of six or more older men all getting laid off when only about 24% of the workforce was older. That's a simulation and we did that using the laws of probability and our calculator. A simulation is the imitation of chance behavior based on a model that accurately reflects the experiment under consideration. So a simulation is pretty much what you think of it is. You are trying to replicate real life circumstances by using a model, a model that is designed based on some assumptions that you have to make to design your simulation. So let's take a look at this example. Girl in the family. Suppose we're interested in estimating the likelihood of a couple having a girl among their first four children. Now my family, I'm the oldest of three sons. My brother has three sons, so we may never have a girl. So maybe this is something we should have tried. Let a fair flip of, a flip of a fair coin represent a birth. So heads would be the girl and tails would represent the boy. And the coin is an accurate imitation of the situation. Flip the coin until either heads appear or until the coin has been flipped four times. The appearance of a head within the first four flips corresponds to the couples having a girl among their first four children. So what this is simulating is how likely it is they are going to have a girl within their first four kids. Heads being the girl, tails being the boy. If you repeat this procedure many times, then the proportion of times that a heads appears in the first four flips should be a good estimate of the true likelihood of the couples having a girl. Now, how many times is many times? Well, the more times the better. And the more times you do it, the more accurate your simulation will be. So, these are the five steps to a simulation. First, you must state the problem or describe the experiment, and this is going to be some random phenomenon. Secondly, you will state the assumptions. So what are you assuming when you conduct your model and conduct your simulation? Third, you will assign digits to represent outcomes, very similar to what you were doing when you were designing experiments. Fourth, you will simulate many repetitions or trials. You're going to do this many times. The more times you do it, the more accurate your simulation will be. And finally, you will state your conclusions. So once again, you will state the problem, state the assumptions, assign digits to represent the different outcomes, simulate many repetitions or trials, and finally, you will state your conclusions. So let's apply Wednesday's simulation to these five steps. First step is to state the problem or describe the experiment, and the experiment has to be some sort of random phenomenon. This was our problem from yesterday. What is the likelihood that six of the ten workers 55 and over that were laid off happened by chance when only 24% of them were 55 and over? In other words, what is the likelihood that those six guys were laid off strictly by luck or good fortune or bad fortune in their case, when only less than a quarter of them we're 55 and over. That is the problem that we want to answer through this simulation. Secondly, we state the assumptions. We have to assume a couple of things here. First of all, we have to assume that 24% of all salespeople are 55 and over. We got that information from a government source, and we all know how reliable the government sources are. Secondly, 
we have to assume that each laid off salesperson does not impact the age of the next salesperson getting laid off. So if you lay off an old guy, you don't know, but we're going to assume that the next person that gets laid off, their age is not based on what the previous person's age was. So it's not as if you lay off a young guy, then you lay off an old guy, or whatever. Basically, you treat each layoff as a separate transaction. Well, that's the idea of independence, which I'll talk about in a few minutes. The third step is to assign digits to represent outcomes. So since you have 24% of the workforce over 55, you're going to use table B and assign 0, 1 to 2, 4 as a simulation of those that are 55 and over. The remaining digit pairs, 25 to double zero, represents everyone else. So you have a 24% chance of selecting someone that's 55 and over and a 76% chance of selecting somebody else. If you use your calculator, you can assign digits 1 to 24 to those that are older and 25 to 100 for everyone else. But the steps are the same. You're just labeling based on the tool that you use to conduct the simulation. Fourth, simulate many repetitions and trials. So in class, I had hoped that you each conducted 20 trials on your calculator and you wrote down how many times of those 20 that you got six or more layoffs of older people. Now, I have a little more time in my hands, as you know. I sit at home all day and don't worry about anything about work or school or anything in life. I just sit at home and do these simulations. So I did 10,000 trials myself. And this is what I got. I used a program. I'm not that bored. So, 6, 17, 0, 2083, 1, and so on. Now, this is the trials. And 10,000 is going to give you a more reliable percentage than merely 20. The more trials you have, the better your percentage should be to the actual number. Finally, you will state your conclusions. In this case, only 149 out of 10,000 simulations showed that six or more salespeople over 55 were layoff. 1.49%. And our final conclusion is that that 1.49% chance is so low that it's considered unlikely or implausible that the layoffs happened the way they did strictly by chance. So the chance of this just happening happening by luck is so low that we suspect there might be something sinister going on in this company, that there might actually be age discrimination going on. And that's how you use the five steps. Now you can simulate using several tools like I did in that example. You can use the random number table like table B, or you can use your calculator using Randint or using some other technological tool that are that is out there for, at your disposal. Here's a myth about randomness. Let's say we have flipped a fair coin eight times and all eight times it came up tails. What is the probability that the next time it will come up heads? Well, it's a myth. Now all of you know that the coin has no memory. It is a 50% chance. Just because tails has come up eight times in a row does not mean that the next coin is more likely to be heads. The coin has no memory. And this goes to what is considered an independent trial. The coin tosses are independent because the results of one toss does not affect the or influence the subsequent toss or the tosses after that. Just because the coin landed heads 25 times in a row, it doesn't mean, oh, it's time to flip up tails. Coin tosses are independent because the result of one toss does not impact any other toss. This also leads us to this law of large numbers that we're going to talk about a little more in the second semester. The more times we flip a coin, the proportion of tails closes in on 0.5, which is what we believe to be the proportion or probability of getting a tails. This is guaranteed by the law of large numbers. Over the long run, i.e. many, many trials, the results will follow the expected value or probability for those results. So if you flip a coin 10 times, you might get 8 heads and think, wow, that's weird. But if you flip it 100, it's going to be closer to 50. You're probably not going to get 80 heads out of 100. If you flip it 1,000, you're going to get even closer still to the probability or proportion of 0.5. That's how the law of large numbers works. How many trials and many trials? A lot. And we'll look at it more in second semester. Let's look at example 5.23, frozen yogurt. Orders of frozen yogurt flavors based on sales have the following relative frequencies. 38% chocolate, 42% vanilla, and 20% strawberry. This is obviously a very boring frozen yogurt shop. So, 
Your task is to simulate 10 frozen yogurt sales based on this recent history. All right, so the relative frequency tells us that 38% of those clients have bought chocolate frozen yogurt, 42% have bought vanilla, and 20% have bought strawberry. All right, so how would you do this simulation? Let's go through the five steps. First of all, you state the problem. What is the problem? The problem is that we want to simulate 10 frozen yogurt sales based on this recent history. How would we do that using this simulation? Second, state the assumptions. The relative frequencies of sales of frozen yogurt flavors are listed. And we're going to use this as the basis of percentages for our simulation. So we have to assume that these are true and these represent all the frozen yogurt customers that come into this frozen yogurt shop. What one customer orders does not affect the other. That's the idea of independence. So just because you walk in and get vanilla doesn't mean that that person's friend is going to get vanilla too or chocolate or strawberry. What each customer orders does not affect the other. You can see how this is merely a simulation and not necessarily based in real life. But then again, this frozen yogurt shop only has chocolate, strawberry, and vanilla ice cream, or frozen yogurt. Third, you're going to assign digits. Now, how would you do that? You have to use the underlying assumptions that you listed. So, since you had a 38% chan chance of chocolate, you will assign digits 0, 01 to 38 to chocolate. You will then assign 39 to 80 to vanilla. That represents 42%. And finally, 81 to double zero for strawberry. That represents the final 20%. Now, you can do the digits any way you want. You might do 00, 0 to 37 for chocolate, 38 to 79 for vanilla, 80 to 99 for strawberry. It does not matter how you do it as long as the proportions match the assumption proportions that you came up with. Four, you're going to simulate many trials. Now, I'm only going to do one, and you're only going to do one, and you're going to use the random number table at the top of page 5-18. So you are going to simulate 10 trials. You have just enough digits to do it, and here you don't have to worry about repeated numbers because you're treating each trial separately. So go ahead and take those pairs and see how many chocolate, vanilla, and strawberries you come up with. All right, let's continue. Pick off any place to start and count off 10 pairs of two-digit numbers. That's what you would do if you were doing the experiment yourself. But I've given you line 135 starting with column 4. And so those numbers give you 78, 45, 81, 12, and so on. If you counted the vanillas and chocolates, you will see that you get 5 V's, 3 C's, and 2 S's. So that is one trial. Now, if you were to do this for real, you would simulate many trials and you would see how the sales were distributed. But this is only one trial. You really can't learn much from one trial. So the other way to do it is use your calculator. Use random 0 to 99 or 1 to 100 and store and sort them in a list. And then you're going to count each value to check the results. So this is a bit cumbersome because you have to go to the list and you have to see which values are between 138 or 39 and 80 or 81 and 100 and go ahead and do that once as well you should get a number that's different than what I got all right let's see how to do this on the calculator so I'm going to use uh, rand in so the first thing you want to do is go to math then go to the probability menu scroll down to rand in or hit 5 and I'm going to use 0 to 99 and I'll use 1 to 100 because that's what I started with so 1 to 100, and I'm going to pick 10 integers that represent the trials. And I don't have to worry about repeating here because each trial is independent. So instead of just sorting them to a list, I mean, instead of just looking at them on a screen, I'm going to sort them to a list. So I'm going to put them into list 1. And not only that, I'm going to do a double command. What you can do is you can sort the list. So put a colon. That represents sorting the list as you did in the simulation. Now you will go to sort ascend. So that's in stat and to sort A, and you are going to select list one. That'll put them in order so you can better see how they're sequenced. So let's hit return. And now we have to go to list one, take a look at it, and there it is. So 12 and 15, that tells me we got two chocolates, 52, 56, 61, 73. That tells me we got four vanillas, which means we should have four strawberries. So that is just one simulation. Your values will very much be different. But remember, this is only one trial, so you can repeat it. So if I want to repeat it, let's do it again. 
scroll up, hit repeat, and now let's take a look at it again. And you see how easy this is. Now you have only you have let's see four chocolates, and you have five strawberry, uh, five vanillas, and only one strawberry at 100. So you can see how it changes every time you rerun the simulations. You can run that several times if you wish just to see how it turns out. Alright, the last step is to state the conclusions. We've run the simulation and what do we get? Well, in the one simulation I got using the random number table, three chocolates, five vanillas, and two strawberries. Can you draw much of a conclusion from this? No. One trial is not enough to draw any conclusions that our estimates are anywhere accurate. So you might have to run it 100 times, 200 times. Am I going to do that here? No. But if you ran it many, many more times, you should see that the percentages that you get overall should approach the percentages you started with. That's how the law of large numbers works. All right, now let's have you do another simulation. This is a girl or four on page 313. And in summary, I've typed it up for you on the sheet. So a couple plans to have children until they have a girl or until they have four kids, whichever comes first. So in the model, we will assume that each child has a probability 0.5 of being a girl and 0.5 of being a boy. And the sexes of successive children are independent. So just because you had one boy does not have any predictive value on the next child. Read digits until you get a girl, or read four digits without a girl. So you can create a model using both table B and your calculator to generate random digits. So I want you to state how you assign the digits, and then write down your results after doing five simulations using each method. And then state your conclusions based on these combined ten simulations. Now I'm going to have you do this yourself. I don't have any slides for it. Once you assign the digits, I want you to pick a start, spot on the random number table to start and use randint to do it. All right, so go ahead and assign the digits. I would like you to try to do it first before I show you what I did. All right, well, here it goes. If you were to simulate a flip of a coin, you could assign half of the digits to one outcome and the other half to the other outcome because getting a girl and getting a boy is 50-50. So there are two ways you could do it. There might be more. You can use one digit, read one digit groups or single digits off the random number table and have groups 0 to 4 represent a boy or a girl and 5 to 9 represent the other sex. That's one way to do it. Another way to do it is just say if we get a single digit that's odd, that's a girl. If we get a single digit that's even, that's a boy. So go ahead and run a simulation. If you have a random number table, you can use it. If you don't, you can find one that I posted on the School Loop page and on Facebook. So go to it, and I will show you how to do it using the calculator. All right, let's try this on a calculator. I'm going to use odd digits representing girls and even digits representing boys. So again, odd digits representing girls, even digits representing boys. Now, I'm going to make it probably a little more complicated than it needs to be. So we'll use ran int, and I'm going to select a digit from 0 to 9, and I'm going to do one at a time. Remember, the deal is, once you get a girl, you stop, or until you get a, four children without a girl. All right, so let's run it once, see what happens. Five, we got a girl. So the first trial, you got a girl. Let's try it. This is our second trial now. One, we got another girl on the first kid. Well, this is a very, very X chromosome type calculator. Now let's do a third trial. Another girl. So we've gotten three girls so far, and the probability is getting pretty high. Let's try a fourth. Yet another girl. So four trials, four girls. And five trials, five girls. And finally, we have a boy. So the way the simulation works is you keep trying to have kids until you either have a girl or you end up with four kids. So let's see what happens here. Oh, that's the second kid. Still a boy. So now you got two boys. Now you got three boys. Now this last one's going to be the final trial regardless of whether you get a boy or a girl. And we got another boy. So in six trials, we have five girls and one time when we did not get a girl. All right, let's run trial number seven. Boy, girl. So on trial number seven, we had a girl on the second try. So it's six to one in favor of the girls. Let's run simulation number eight. Boy, girl. So it's now eight to uh, seven to one. 
in favor of the girl. Start over again. Boy, boy, girl. So it's now 8 to 1 in favor of the girls. And our 10th simulation, girl. So out of the 10 simulations, in 9 of them, we got a girl within the first four kids. Now, obviously, your responses might be different. But the chances of, and if you think about this, the chances of having a girl are pretty high if you're willing to try up to four times. All right, now back on the screen, remember you must state your conclusions. So in my conclusion, out of the 10 trials I did on the calculator, in nine of them, I got a girl before I had four boys. So does that mean that it's a 90% chance of getting a girl before four boys? No, but the more simulations you do, and I would say more, I've seen thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, the more simulations you do, the more accurate your results will be. Now in these cases, we know the percentage is about 50-50. In real life, this is much more difficult because a lot of things in life you do not know the actual percentage of. That concludes section 5.3. I hope you did the simulations because if you did, that will help you and put you a good set for the problems that you're going to be doing in class on Thursday. If you have any questions, please let me know either using Facebook or email or bugging me before, after class, whenever. I'm always around.